Well, I was going to start off my talk today saying that when I was a little kid, when I was 12, 13, 14 years old, I was, I was good at math. And then I'm, I'm realizing I am following a man who is far better at math, far better at engineering than I ever thought I could be. So it's really, it's an inappropriate way to go, but it's how I started off the uh, presentation anyway. And I've actually even got a visual aid. I'll see if I can make that click. That's me. Uh, that's... Uh, that's me when I was 17 years old. Um, this is a, a trophy from a computer programming competition that I won when I was 17. But I was really, I, I'm thinking about it now, I'm more, I'm more like small, small town good at math. You know, I was in a really, really, really small town. It was a coal mining town. Uh, so among the 180 people in my high school, I was maybe the fourth best at math. And that's really my plateau. But uh, when... When you think that you're good at math and you're, you're too stupid to realize that you're not actually good at math, you, you start going down this, this path. And also, I don't know if you can tell by this picture, I'm looking at it now sort of in, in horror, uh, but um, I, uh, I weighed about 120 pounds. So you're good at math, you weigh about 120 pounds. You, you, you take some sort of power in that. And you say, okay, this is my path, this is my direction. I'm not going to be on the football team. I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to excel in anything physical probably in my entire life. Uh, I'm going to enter the arena of the mind. And so without really even thinking about it, you set off on this path. Path, sorry. So I'm going through puberty um, <laughs> during this. Um, <clears throat> still, still awkward after all these years. And uh, so you set off on this path, and so that's what I did. I joined the computer club, I played a little bit of chess, and I became an engineer, really not thinking about the path that was being charted for me for the rest of my life. I, I should also mention, I'm, I know there's only 18 minutes, but I'm going to just fixate on this picture. Uh, the, the, I don't know how you translate this into, into Greek and whether this movie was really important uh, to you as it was to me, but when I was 16 years old, a movie came out called 16 Candles. Um, uh, perhaps that was a big movie here too. Um, I looked exactly like Anthony Michael Hall from 16 Candles, so my entire life was like, do you know you look exactly like the king of the dorks from, si yeah, I do, I do know that, and thank you for, I'm going on my path. So, I entered university, I, I went to Rice University in Houston, Texas, which is an engineering school, and I started studying mechanical engineering. And then, uh, my sophomore year, I got offered an internship at Shell Oil. And so I took it, and I was really still gung-ho. I was going to be the best damn intern that Shell Oil had ever seen, and I was pretty solid. I was good enough that the next year they gave me an internship, and after that internship, oh, wait, I think I have a picture. That's me. Uh, that's me I, I, in the oil field at, at, in Shell. And I should really be probably working harder and not taking a camera into the oil field, but, I, you know, I, I am. I'm just kind of jerking around in the oil field. My... Um, my job there that particular summer was to design a new pan called a sand pan that wouldn't clog up. So they had big tankers and full of oil and water and sand, and they'd drain them off of the bottom, and the, the sand would sometimes clog, and then you'd have to clean the tank. So we worked all summer trying to build a better sand pan, for which we actually got a patent, um, which I don't think I, um, I don't get any royalties off of that, but uh, hopefully it made some money for Shell back, back then, because I certainly abandoned them eventually. That, but that's jumping ahead. Uh, anyway, I was good enough to also get a job offer at the end of my junior year. So two internships, and then I went into engineering. Going into my, my, my senior year of college at Rice, I already had a job. I had already basically entered the middle class and it wasn't really until my senior year that I started to realize, there it is again, uh, I started to realize that I'd actually made a catastrophic mistake. I didn't, I didn't even like this. I, didn't, I, I don't like math, and I'm actually not very good at it, and I'm a pretty mediocre engineer. I was just really gung-ho, uh, and I was, I was seeing myself now 45 years, 50 years in the future, retiring from this job and thinking, I've, I've screwed my entire life. And uh, so uh, I, I actually finished up my college education, got my degree, and then I actually uh, did one of those sort of quintessentially, uh, I don't know, collegiate, American collegiate things. You go on a Eurail rail trip across the country, and I went to Greece for the first time. So this is my second time. It's, it's absolutely awesome to be back here. I was stinkier. I didn't shower much on that trip, but uh, <laughs> I, I really, really love my time in Greece, and it's, it's a huge honor to be back here to be talking about very trivial things, so uh, in, in light of the grand ideas that are going to be going on here today. But I, I swear to you, there's going to be a point here very, very, very shortly. Um, so, um, 
I, uh, I'm going to tell, I'm going to, when I say that, I'm actually going to veer off onto another tangent. So I'm going to tell you about my first day at work at Shell Oil. I, I went, I, got, I filled out all my paperwork, I, I got my 401k started, I, uh, I signed up for health insurance, and the, the lady in our HR said, okay, we got one more thing you got to do before you go to your office, you got to go down to the basement and you got to pick out your art. And I had, I had no earthly idea what all these syllables meant together. I didn't understand what that meant to go down to the basement and pick out your art. And so I was really sort of horrified and fascinated about the prospect of what might meet me in the basement. So I went down to the basement and uh, you are faced with this gigantic warehouse and they had basically three categories, three columns of art, most of them oil paintings, some of them, uh, some of them photographs. And so column one was landscapes, and then column two was oil derricks or walking beam oil pumps, and then column three was this magical hybrid of landscapes and oil derricks and, and such. So you got to go down, and you're an engineer, starting engineer. You've got an office. You've got three walls and one window. So basically, you're allocated three pieces of art from any of the columns. You can mix and match any way you want. And I knew at that moment that I had to get the hell out of this place. That was, <laughs> that was not where I wanted to be. And uh, when I was at college, I, I, I put together all of my electives. You can, you can get a broad education at Rice, but you can also get a very narrow one. I was extremely narrow. I, I did the curriculum for mechanical engineering, but then I also got a degree in art and art history, which I, over, the, over the years in college, I realized that that's where I, really, that's where I really had my passion and that's what I liked. And so the idea of going into the basement and picking out my art was basically the, the line in the sand where I said, okay, at a certain point, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go do something that I want to do. Uh, and it was actually strange. Every, when I got to meet the rest of the team, probably 80, 85% of the folks, when I go to their office and said, hello, I was looking at their walls and it was the combination of landscape, oil derrick, or the magical combination of landscape and oil derrick. Okay, um, so on my way to work, I, I, I was working for Shell. I worked there for about two years. About a year and a half into it, uh, on my way to work, there was an abandoned movie theater. And so the, the topic of today's TED Talks is first steps and standing on the brink of a major decision in your life. And this was it. This was that epiphany moment, that literal, no, it's not literal, actually, it's figurative, uh, light bulb that goes off in your head and says, this is a major decision. So I, there was a, a movie theater on my way to work. And one day, there was a for lease sign on said movie theater. And that was the big idea for me. I, I loved movies. I don't think I, I mentioned that quite yet. I, I, I'm going to go back in time, back to when I was um, looking a lot like Anthony Michael Hall. So during those days uh, when I, I, I wasn't engaging in much physical activity whatsoever, my, my buddies and I, the nerdy, skinny, uh, pasty buddies, uh, every weekend because girls didn't like us very much and we liked to shelter ourselves away from stronger people. We would hole up and we would watch movies every Friday and Saturday night. So it was the birth of the mom and pop video stores in America and we learned this magical little trick that if you had your family's membership card, they didn't give a damn what you rented. So anything that had boobs or blood or, or rampaging animals or the, the wild combination of all three, they would let us rent. So we just had our own little uh, uh, movie education. Uh, I mean, it was very squalid and very um, inappropriate. And my mother, who's probably going to watch this online, will, will probably realize that I've I spent my youth watching movies that I probably shouldn't have, a lot of really, really inappropriate movies. But anyway, that was my, my movie education. And I never thought that I could have a career by watching and showing movies. And so that for lease sign that was up on that marquee uh, changed my life. And I got on the phone with my girlfriend at the time. And so my, my girlfriend is uh, actually here in the audience. She's now my wife. Um, and she's been my business partner for quite a long time, 22, 23 years. <laughs> Um, so she uh, was also at Rice and got a degree in um, uh, biology, microbiology. So she, out of college, she worked at a microbiology research facility. And uh, there, it was a 25-year project. They were trying to synthesize human blood from yeast cultures. It's pretty much one of the greatest things you could do, really, is to have a pure blood supply for all of mankind for the rest of time. Um, but the 
harsh reality of a situation like that is you have to love that as well because that means 25 years of very minute adjustments to petri dishes over and over and over again. And while her co-workers were spending their lunch breaks reading Microbiology Today, uh, she was reading Entertainment Weekly and she was you know, talking to me about what movie we were going to do. And we actually... If there's going to be one great idea out of this presentation, which you're probably wondering if that's ever going to happen, um, uh, we had devised the scheme. She was in San Francisco. I was in Bakersfield, California. We were five hours apart. So our movie dates would be we'd pick out a movie at the same exact time. We'd go to the theater. We'd watch that movie. And then we'd come back home, and we'd immediately call each other and sort of dissect and have that post-movie coffee conversation about the movie in two different cities. So you guys can take that. That's the big idea from this particular TED Talk. You know, <laughs> pass that on to whoever needs it. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is I wasn't liking engineering, and she wasn't liking her job in microbiology, and we were looking for an escape plan. We were looking to do something else. And, oh, wait, you know what? Let me see if this works. I've got a picture. Next slide. I've got a picture of the theater. Um, so this is the theater that I... I, I went past on my way to work. And so I went past this. I called my girlfriend, now wife, uh, on the phone. I said, this is it. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan. And uh, so up until that point, I'd had, a, I'd had several jobs. I was a paper boy. I delivered papers. I uh, was a bus boy at a steakhouse. And I, I ran Ethernet cable uh, when I was in college. I was a mechanical engineer. And then I thought that gave me the right to go ahead and enter into the small business world and become a movie theater operator. So with about three hours worth of work uh, formulating a business plan, um, the, next, the very next week I signed the lease on the theater, I quit my job at Shell, and I became a movie theater operator and owner. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I look back on those days and it was this heady mix of Arrogance, I had arrogance galore, and uh, stupidity. And so those are my two defining traits at that age. And so they're actually, it's actually a very powerful mix of things that you, you have the arrogance to move forward and you're so stupid that you don't know all the things that are going to be problematic in this exercise and all the reasons why you couldn't do it and shouldn't do it. So you just do it. And uh, I do think that maybe the, uh, the engineering degree that I got sort of helped me in a strange way dissect this into little tiny problems, uh, the grand problem of opening up a movie theater and dissecting into the little tiny problems and solving them. Um, but I guess the, um, the important thing that comes out of this is that I made a decision to do something I loved. And 23 years later now, I'm, I'm incredibly happy doing what I'm doing. I was very, I was very unhappy because I wasn't a good engineer. You can find satisfaction in engineering, for sure that you can. I was surrounded by people that loved it and were passionate about it. I just didn't have that same passion. I was sort of like that guy from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, just sort of faking it and hoping nobody would notice that I wasn't really part of the, of the tribe. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, I, I look back to, to my parents and my wife's parents and at the time, you can imagine that they had just spent a, a lot of money on our education, and I, we both went into the sciences. We were both going to potentially be doing something important with our lives, and we threw it all away to serve popcorn. And um, uh, so, but I think there's also that mentality in general that there's a that there's a path you have to take in life. But I'm here to say that the path you have to take in life is to do something that you love and to be passionate about every aspect of your job. Is life is too precious and time is too precious to do anything else. And I, I used to tell people that what you want to do is you want to do this and make your mistakes and get it over with when you're young because you, you don't have any encumbrances. You don't have kids that are depending on you. Uh, but now I, do have, I finally do have kids. I've got twin three-year-old girls. And it's now that I realize that screw that, I mean, you should actually, you should do it anytime. Uh, because really the only problem that you face by catastrophic failure, uh, which is definitely a possibility when you're arrogant and stupid and you venture out to do your own business. Um, but the only thing, the really the worst case scenario is that you lose all your stuff. You declare bankruptcy. 
And that's really not that bad. You could still, you can still, you could still survive. I think the pursuit of overall happiness trumps the idea of losing all of your stuff. And so I take it all back. Don't do it when you're young. Do it anytime. Just be happy with what you do. And so that's the, that's the big idea. Um, Oh, by the way, this is me without a shirt off. Uh, those are the, with my shirt off, yeah. So I don't know. It's the only picture we have during the early days of construction, and you can see my nipples. And I, should, I could have cropped it uh, a little bit just to spare you that. But uh, anyway, this is uh, my wife and I, first day of construction, getting started. We, we just went to the library, and we, we read books about how to hang sheetrock and how to I apologize to the citizenry of Bakersfield, how to run electrical wiring. Sorry, I mean, it's, it never burned down, but uh, you know. Uh, but we just figured it out. We, we, we were passionate about what we wanted to do. And, and now, it's some 22 years later, and we're really, we're really in the same place. We're not a mom and pop theater anymore. We are a, a bigger chain of theaters. We have a small distribution company, but it comes from this lifelong love of movies. And ultimately, movies, uh, the reason for having movies is just to make people happy. And I, I was having breakfast the other day with um, a, a guy I know in Austin. He's one of my business mentors, is uh, Gary Keller from Keller Williams Realty. And I was, I was self-deprecating. I was saying, you know, uh, we're, not, we're not doing anything important, right? We're just showing movies. I mean, we're not, we're not doing, uh, oh, wait, I have a visual aid. Um, we're not doing artificial heart transplants or anything like that. That's a really gory slide. I apologize. That's uh, it's inappropriate. But it is Creative Commons. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not anymore. My wife was at one point uh, saving the world by creating a pure blood supply. We're just showing movies. And uh, so Gary just bangs on the table, gets really, like, legitimately mad. And he says, hey, Tim, you know what? The only reason why people get artificial heart transplants, the only reason why people are living longer is so they can watch more movies. And so <laughs> kind of drove it on home for me that, um, I don't know, just be happy, uh, do something you love, and please, for the love of God, watch more movies because that, that is the most important thing in life. And with that, I close. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <clears throat> you.